Today, we're talking about backup power right here on GP Outdoors. Welcome back to the channel. Every year around this time, as we start to approach into September, I get a noticeable increase on the number of views and questions and comments on the channel on a couple of videos I've done in the past on backup power as well as my solar system. So this year, I thought maybe I'd introduce you to a different option that probably you don't know about that might be a little more affordable. For about ten dollars to $15,000 Canadian, you can get a fully installed backup system similar to what I have here. Or for about $2,000 Canadian, you can install this little plug on the outside of your house. Stick around and I'll tell you all about it. A little disclosure before we go any further. I am not an electrician, nor am I an expert on backup power. I've had this off-grid cabin for over 10 years now, so I've got a pretty good knowledge and a base of information behind me, but I'm not an expert. The second thing is you're going to see different products throughout the video with different brand or manufacturer names on them. I am not telling you that they're good products or bad products. I'm not promoting the products. I'm not telling you that whether they're better than other brands or not. They just happen to be the brand of equipment that I use here at the cottage. So most likely when you think about backup or standby power to a utility outage to your home, you think about a unit or some type of an installation or a system that looks similar to this. You buy a unit, it's a self-contained unit, regardless of the brand or manufacturer. You need a fuel source, whether it's natural gas or propane, in my case, up here in rural Ontario. That propane needs to be buried to the unit. You've got hydro cables buried into your house, and you've got what's called a transfer switch or some form of an automated device that is attached to your hydro panel in the home. Works pretty simply. When you've got a utility power outage, the unit or the system will immediately, within milliseconds, see that there's a loss of electricity, signals the generator, generator will fire up and it will power your home or parts or different appliances within your home as you've determined with whoever your installer is or whatever company you've done business with. When the utility power eventually turns back on, that transfer switch or that equipment will immediately see the new signal or that electricity is now coming back from the utility and it will signal and shut off the generator. But there is a much more economical option. It's more manual but it does the exact same thing, which I think, based on the questions or the comments that I get on the channel, a lot of folks are not aware of. It's this little plug sitting on the outside of my house. That plug, paired with a portable generator, will do the exact same thing, just not automated. Let me explain how it works. You call your local electrician, and you tell him that you want to power your house, in the case of an outage, with a portable generator. He'll come in, and he's going to install this rather large plug, on the outside of your house, he's going to run it to a transfer switch, similar to what I just discussed, but not automated, that's going to reside by the hydro panel in your house. He's going to make you up a length of big heavy gauge cable that looks like this with plugs on the end. And you're going to head out to Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever your local outlets are, and you're going to find yourself a simple portable generator that has enough generating watts to power your house. So how does it work? Same as the first example. You're sitting in your home, you realize that your utility power has now gone out, you've got a blackout or an outage of some sort, but instead of automatically having generation into the house and your power coming on by itself, you have to do it yourself. You head into the hydro room, you'll see the transfer switch there, there'll be usually a big black switch. You flip that switch, so what that does basically is it connects your house to the outside plug and disconnects you from any external electricity source. Super important walk around the back of the house, take that big long cable, you plug one into the house, you plug the other one into your generator. I have a switched outlet, so I can plug it in first. I fire up the generator. Once she's up to running speed after about a minute or two, I hit the switch and the house comes alive. When you eventually find out or are notified that the utility hydro is back on, you come back out, shut off the generator, unplug it, go back into the house, flip that transfer switch, and you're now connected again to utility power. It's that simple. I know, you're probably skeptical. I was too at first, a number of years back, but I've now had that exact setup with that same portable generator operating here through four Canadian winters, and it has never once let me down. It powers the entire house. Yeah, but GP, that's not a house, that's a cottage. Not true, it's a house. I have every single appliance or electrical load that you have at your house with the exception of air conditioning. I've got an oven, I've got a stove, I've got a 19 cubic foot fridge. I have an HVAC system with an HRV and a full furnace. I've got a sump pump, I've got a water pump, I've got a sewage pump. I've got a coffee maker, microwave, 
I have everything in that 1,500 square foot home that you have with the exception of air conditioning and that little generator runs that entire load through the middle of winter with that furnace cycling on constantly without a hiccup. So let's talk about the pros and cons of each. So with a standby or a backup system similar to this one, the pros, fully automated. Whether you're home or you're not home, whether you're on vacation or at work, or it's the middle of the night and the power goes out, it's self running. It's totally automated from start to finish. You don't have to worry about crossing electricity from the utility versus your backup source. And if you're in a position where you may have health issues in the family where you need to have constant power for whatever equipment might be in the house, probably the best solution, although more expensive, is to make sure you're fully automated so that you don't go through any type of a power outage. The cons, price of course, they're pretty expensive systems. And especially if you have an average sized home or you have an average sized demand, you're gonna be looking in that price range I mentioned earlier. Plus you've got annual maintenance costs to maintain the equipment throughout the years. And lastly, if this system fails for some reason, you can't fix it yourself. You have to call for service and especially if you're in one of their busy periods, you may be waiting a while. Some of the pros of having a portable solution, it's a portable generator. Not only can you use it for the home, but it's also good if you've got property because if you need power away from the property, you're gonna end up with a portable generator anyways. You just need to make sure you get one that's sized properly. That way you can run power tools or other things out on the property when you're away from electricity, but you've also got it on hand in the event that you've got a power outage. And this option is not generator specific. In other words, it's not built for only this generator. If for some reason this generator eventually fails on me and doesn't work anymore, I can very quickly run down the road, borrow somebody else's, or run to the store and buy one and plug it in and it'll work just the same. Cons, it's manual from start to finish. So if the power goes out in the middle of the night or in the day when you're not home, you're gonna have to get it fired up again after you get home. So if you're away for a number of days, you have food in the fridge or the freezer, that food's probably gonna spoil. If it's a few hours or four or five, six hours, it's not gonna do anything because your fridge will keep it. But at the end of the day, you need to start, hook it up, fire it up and run it until the power comes back on and then shut it off again manually. I think what started to make this portable solution a little bit more appealing to a lot of folks is that over the number of years and changes and advances in technology, you can get some pretty good high output portable generators at reasonable prices. As an example, this unit here, certainly not a Honda, but it was $750 at Lowe's four years ago. It's got 7,100, I believe, starting watts, and it has a run wattage of 5,700 watts or 5.7 kilowatts. That's why I can run this entire house because my demand load virtually never reaches even five kilowatts. This thing, every time I've run it, runs without a hiccup, never labors because I never have enough load in the house to make it labor. So it's a good sized unit. Few things I'd look at if you are considering this, these larger units weigh a ton, they're not light. You wanna make sure whatever unit you get has wheels and a handle on the other end because you're gonna to need to pull it. You're certainly not gonna lift it. One of the things that attracted me to this unit, it's got, at the time, it boasted the largest gas tank of any other portable in its size. And I believe that to be true. You can put eight gallons of gas in this thing. When I've used it in the winter, full furnace, using my oven, all of my appliances, I can fill this up in the afternoon and it'll go right through until mid to late next morning before I wanna put gas in it again, which means I can go to bed and sleep knowing that it's gonna run all night, and it does. Great gas tank. It's got a fuel gauge on it so I can see what's left in it. In this case, it's got electric start, which I think is important. You can also manually pull it if you choose to. It's got a number of different outlets so that if I'm using it just for regular 110 or 120 volt appliances or power tools, I can plug in and it has more than sufficient power to manage the house. In the four years I've had this unit, it has never not started. I've never once had to trickle charge that battery, even though it sat outside for four years. And I just, just before I did this video today is the first time I've started it since last January. And she started right up on the first push and then ran smooth as can be. Like I said, I don't know much about the brand and I'm not pushing the brand, but what I am saying is that, you know, you want a Honda in this size, you're paying about 5,000 Canadian at right now, as I've done this video, just checked this morning. 
This one was 750 bucks, came with a cover, came with the, the whole kit for the pull kit with the wheels. And for four years use with a three year warranty, I can't complain about it. And other than that, I would just highly recommend that you make sure that you buy a unit that has enough running wattage that it's going to power the demand in your home. Everything. How do you figure that out? Well, the electrician that you end up choosing will be able to provide you a pretty accurate picture of what the consumption is or how much power or running watts you're gonna need for your home. That's what they do for a living. But I can show you a very simple way of estimating it and it'll work out pretty good for you. Come on inside. Any appliance or device or piece of equipment or light in your home is going to have some kind of a rating plane or information associated to that tells you how many watts or how much power it draws when you turn it on. Whether it's your oven, your range, your microwave, coffee maker, the fridge, your furnace, your air conditioner, the television, your DVD player, your light bulbs, they'll all tell you how much power they draw. And you'll usually find that information on the rating plate that's on that appliance or on that device. Let me give you an example. Let's take a look at the coffee maker. You'll see on the bottom, and I'm not sure how well you can see it, it's actually imprinted in the plastic, but you'll see the model number, serial number, and right here at the very bottom, it'll tell you that it needs 120 volt supply at 60 hertz, and then you see that third number. It says 1025W. That means when you turn this coffee maker on, it will suck or consume 1025 watts of power in order for it to make your coffee until it shuts off. Your light bulb is pretty simple. Take a look at the top of that light bulb and it will tell you how many watts that bulb is. If you're not on LEDs yet and you've got the old style bulbs, you know, we're all familiar with a 100 watt bulb or a 60 watt bulb. That means when you turn the light on, it's using 100 watts. If you have appliances such as your oven or your microwave that's built in or the fridge and you want an easier way to find out or your furnace or air conditioner, for example, Take a look at the manual. It'll always tell you in the manual under the specifications chart. Let me show you. Let's look at the microwave. Got my manual, and like any other manual, you'll usually find in the very back of the manual there's a specifications page. It tells you a lot about the unit, but importantly for this exercise, I'll zoom in. Under specifications, it'll tell you the source required, which of course here is 120 volts and 60 hertz. But here's an interesting example of the appliances you have in the home and many of the devices. It says the power consumption it uses is 1,490 watts of power. However, like many other appliances, when you first turn the appliance on, it tends to draw more energy at first instantaneously and then it'll drop down. So you'll see the cooking power required is 1,100 watts. And it's as simple as that. Grab a pad of paper, sit down, Write down all of the energy consuming devices that you have, especially the major ones like your oven, coffee maker, your microwave, furnace, air conditioner, TVs. Lights is a pretty simple one. You may have 30 lights in your home and if you've got 100 watt bulbs in every one, you probably don't turn on all 30 at night. You might use five or six. So write down five or 600 watts to cover lights at night. And then for the rest of your appliances, go through your manuals or on the back of those appliances and write down how much power they consume when they run. And lastly, and very importantly, add 500 watts. You wanna add that 500 watts on for what they call a phantom load or what you may have heard is called vampire loads or I call mystery loads. You don't think you're using anything in the home, but you've got a lot of stuff plugged in and many devices will still leak or use little bits of electricity and combined you'll end up with a load and in my case it's a very small load but i'm actually able to measure it because on the solar system i actually have a meter that tells me how much load is being consumed in the home at any given second let's take a look at what it says so even though i have nothing turned on on the home right now i'm currently drawing 330 watts of power with nothing turned on and that's why I'd suggest that you add about 500 to whatever your total is, just to capture that phantom load or that vampire load. And your last step, rationalize that load. You've added up all of those different devices and then think about it in a power outage. Would you use the microwave at the same time you use the oven? Or could you use the microwave first and use the oven after you've turned off the microwave? Because remember, it's not about what you use over a long period of time sequentially, 
It's about how much power you draw all at the exact same time, which is what they refer to, you know, non-scientifically as your demand load. And that's the number you want to get to. So I know for me, I can turn on the microwave and wait and whatever I put in there, once it's done, then turn the oven on, use it. I would never turn the coffee maker on at the same time I'm using the microwave or the oven. I can, because I have more than enough generating wattage out of that generator to do it. But what I want to do is keep my demand low. So I'll have lights on. I know my fridge is going to cycle. I know in the winter, my furnace is cycling all day and all night. So there's that load for sure. And I know that my stove or my oven will use about one 1 1.2 kW when it runs. This microwave, believe it or not, is one of the most highest energy consuming devices in your home. This thing sucks more energy than my furnace does. So is the coffee maker. So I know not to turn the coffee maker on at the same time. So when I'm trying to assess what my demand load should be or could be to be comfortable in a power outage, I know that I don't have to turn all three of these on at once. So instead of having to make arrangements for three and a half kW of load, or in other words, 3,500 watts, I'll make concession for about 1,500 watts because I know I don't have to turn them all on at once. And that's how you kind of rationalize and get to that bottom number. And you use that number to start doing your research or your diligence on what type of generators can provide that type of running power or running wattage, not starting running and that'll give you an idea of what price range you're in and what type of models are out there to choose from so hey i think that's going to wrap it up i'm sorry if it was a little longer than i expected but i went back through and i tried to answer as many of the questions that i've already received to date as well as some that i foresee getting in the next month or two as we get into winter point of the video again was just to let you know about an option that you may not have been aware of or that you hadn't considered yet as you try to decide whether or not putting in a backup generation or power source for you and your family is something that you want to do. At least you've got some information that you can take a look at and consider as you make that decision. And I wish you all the best. If you like the channel, please click subscribe, hit the like button. And if you want to know when I'm posting videos, just click that little bell. Have a great week with your families. Please be kind to one another. And I'll see you again right here on GP Outdoors. Cheers.